Jesus plus nothing, 100% natural, no additives. Andrew Farley's celebrating your freedom in Christ. Call in and ask your questions at 877-956-9566. That's toll free at 877-956-9566. Via satellite from Texas, it's Andrew Farley Live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Andrew Farley Live. This is Andrew Farley, and uh, taking your calls right now at 877-956-9566. Again, that's 877-956-9566. Now, uh, if you're not familiar with our program, what we do here is we basically uh, offer ourselves for the next hour if you have a question that you, regards the Bible, something that you've been wondering about, well, we're excited to take that call. Or maybe you have something going on in your personal life, and it's, a, it's an issue, something in your family, uh, a struggle or a personal struggle. Well, uh, that's why we're here. So, again, that number is 877-956-9566. Well, uh, I want to go ahead and start off the program with a question um, that we have from the email. And basically, that question is, do you believe that Christ and the Holy Spirit reside in our spirits? Is it important to distinguish between the two? And, uh, well, you know, there really isn't a distinction, Richard. Uh, Richard C. here calling in, uh, emailing in from the east coast the the issue essentially is that paul refers to the spirit of christ and that's in romans and if you don't have the spirit of christ well you don't belong to him so you'll notice that the holy spirit is sometimes called the spirit of christ and uh, that is very important to wrap your mind around because it's not like Jesus and the Holy Spirit are on different uh, wavelengths here. Uh, you know, if you've got the Spirit, that's the Spirit of Christ, the nature of Christ. Christ is in our hearts. Uh, and so uh, there is no distinction. If you have the Spirit, you have Christ. If you have Christ, you have the Spirit. They're one and the same. And, of course, now we're getting into the midst of the Trinity, aren't we? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that... Uh, you know, if we invite Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus himself says that we will come and we will make our abode in him. And that's in the Gospels. It's very interesting that Jesus uses the word we there. So I like to tell people, kind of reassure people, really, that uh, wherever you go, there's four of you. Uh, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and you. So you're never alone. Uh, Richard, I appreciate your question. Uh, coming in on email. And uh, again, if you have a question, we'd love to hear from you today. It's 877-956-9566. Again, that's 877-956-9566. Well, uh, here's another one that uh, came in from uh, Rick. And Rick writes, I was taught growing up that that uh, there were two judgments in heaven, the great white throne judgment and then the judgment seat of Christ for the saved people. Uh, is there really two judgments, and what about the Bema? Well, that's a great question, Rick. Uh, you know, um, one of the things that often comes up uh, is this idea of two judgments. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, if, if God wants to do two judgments, well, that's his prerogative. He can do whatever he wants. But, uh, you know, the idea that God has to have two separate judgments, I just don't see it. Uh, if, if there's an intermission in the middle, so be it. That's fine. But uh, what I see in Revelation 20 and 21 is that Revelation 20, the unbelievers are judged. And then Revelation 21, the believers are judged. And, uh, you know, they're right there with the unbelievers. There's one a group of humans. And that's why Corinthians tells us we must all appear at the judgment seat of Christ. And I don't think all just means Christians. All means humans. And then it goes on to say, and we'll be recompensed for our deeds, whether good or bad. Well, Christians are not recompensed for their bad deeds. My goodness, what does the gospel mean if that happens? The gospel would mean nothing. Uh, the whole point of the gospel is Jesus died for your sins. That's your bad deeds. Jesus paid for your sins. That's your bad deeds. So you're not going to be paid back, recompensed for your bad deeds. Uh, Jesus Christ paid that price in full. So when we all humans appear at this judgment seat, I personally think it's going to be one big event, 
And uh, the first part will be unbelievers, and they'll be judged, uh, you know, and then the believers will be judged. But, the, of course, the outcome will be totally different. Um, in Revelation 21, the, the Christians aren't lectured. They aren't scorned. Uh, they aren't punished. Uh, they're told to enter into eternity with Jesus Christ as his bride, holy and blameless. And so it's very much like uh, what Jesus says in Matthew 25. There's sheep and there's goats. But as I like to say, there's no shoats and there's no geep. <laughs> in other words, there's no hybrid animal. There's only sheep and goats. And so you're either in Christ as a sheep or you're in Adam as a goat. And so uh, there are two different outcomes for this judgment. We all appear, and yet there are two different outcomes. Now, uh, you know, I spoke recently on this question as well, Rick. You know, people ask about the Bema. And uh, it's important to recognize that while many Christians, many Christian teachers, um, persuasively argue that the Bema seat is a separate judgment only for good things to happen, the Bema, they would say, is a positive judgment just for giving out rewards. Well, um, you know, uh, the reality is when you do a search for the word Bema in the New Testament, in the Bible, you basically figure out that the the word Bema appears a bunch of times. And it's not always pretty. I mean, sometimes the word Bema is used for a Roman or Jewish ruler to bring down punishment from a Bema seat. And so the idea that it's, you know, about the Olympics and it's about everybody getting their heavenly rewards only uh, and that that's all that Bema can ever mean is really misleading. Um, Based on the Bible, uh, clearly the word Bema appears many times. And so why am I bringing this up? I'm just saying we don't have to have two separate judgment events. We don't have to tell people that uh, there's a separate event for Christians. I just think it could very well be one big event. And the point is, the big point is, look, Jesus Christ was already judged for your sins. The verdict was guilty because you were guilty. The punishment was death and Jesus died and it's paid in full. So how about waking up and just living in the in the security and the comfort of that, that he is full payment uh, and it's finished. That's called the finished work of Christ, and that's what we celebrate on this program. Uh, if you'd like to talk more about that or have a question about anything, go ahead and give us a call at 877-956-9566. Well, let's go ahead out to Ann in Belleville, Maryland. Um, hello, Ann. You're on the air. Hi, good morning, good afternoon. My question to you is this. I'm, I'm confused about a lot of teachings that I get, and I just want to get the truth. I was told that when a Christian, a believer die, right, mm-hmm. that you go to funerals and you hear the pastor saying, they are no longer there, their soul is in heaven. Mm-hmm. And I was told just recently that your soul is you, like, oh, this good soul. So when you die, you have to wait as a believer, in the grave until Jesus comes back. And then those who are in the grave, they will, the grave will open and they will be caught up with him in the air. And those who are alive will also go up. So I want to get clarification on this, if it is that your soul, if you, when you die, if you are, mm, <laughs> as soon as mm. you die, if your soul goes in heaven. And also about um, Halloween, is Christians... Be, uh, supposed to be taking part. I went to church this morning. This pastor said he was out there with his kids enjoying Halloween, blah, blah, blah. I don't mm-hmm. know. Okay, and well, uh, the first question is a very, very important one regarding mm-hmm. our soul and, our, of course, our spirit. Uh, you know, we are spirit, soul, and body. Mm-hmm. And so our spirit is how we relate to God. Our soul is how we relate to each other. You know, the Greek okay. word for soul is uh, suke. And so Uh, You have a a spirit, but then you also have a suke, a soul, Mm -hmm. and that's where we get our word psychology from. So you have a personality, you have a psychology to you, and you also have a spiritual part of your being called the spirit. So each each human is spirit, soul, and body. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we die, well, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Uh, The Bible tells us that you know, we are present with the Lord when we are not here physically. Now, I'd like to throw one more thing in, Anne, and that is that if you're a Christian, Mm -hmm. you are already raised and seated in heavenly places. And so 
you know, once we understand spiritual geography, it's a bit difficult to grasp uh, and wrap our minds around, but just realize that everyone is somewhere spiritually, mm-hmm. that uh, spiritually you are either in Adam or you are in Christ. And if you are in Christ, then you're already seated in heaven. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 that he raised and seated you in heaven. So the idea that we go to heaven later is only partially true. Uh, Spiritually, we've already been seated in heaven, and that's true now. Uh, It's true of our human spirit, that we are next to God at his right hand. So then uh, we die, but really it's just our body that dies. And immediately... To be absent from the body is to be present, uh, you know, in a new physicality, so to speak, Um, in a new uh, physical geography. We are present with the Lord, but we were already in his presence spiritually. So, um, you know, there's 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 another thing to throw in here. And and that is that remember, I mean, when we think with our human brains about time, Uh, We think of our sun and our moon, and we see our stars go by as our planet rotates and revolves. And, um, and, you know, all of that is God-created time for us. But when we die, we enter into eternity fully. And uh, we don't understand it all, but let me just say that it wouldn't surprise me that if the moment we die physically, we are then in the presence of the Lord, and we've entered into eternity, so the sounding of the trumpet, in a sense, has already happened. And maybe we're even at that moment. Uh, we can see all of Earth's time. Uh, so, you know, Earth's time is a created time, and God created it uh, with our universe and with the sun and the stars and all that. And so uh, just keep in mind that we have eternal life, and when we die, we enter into eternity. And I don't think we're going to be sitting in the dark in some holding tank somewhere waiting uh, to get our bodies. Uh, To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Um, Now, you know, Anne, your second question is also very interesting, especially at this time of year regarding Halloween. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, obviously people can trace the roots of of Halloween or Hallow's Eve back to uh, very dark roots and uh, talk about where it all came from. And nothing about it is really respectable or honorable. Um, But the Christian debate over this kind of reminds me of food sacrifice to idols. Mm. Um, You know, I mean, some people make a big deal out of food sacrifice to idols. And then Paul comes along and says, look, don't offend anybody or anything. But remember, there are no other gods. There are no idols out there that are real um so uh you know it's all a mirage it's all pretend and there's no depth to it so you know i would say don't overreact either way um you don't want to overreact and start really getting into the roots of halloween and of course getting into dark dark stuff Mm -hmm. but you also don't want to go ultra legalistic and just uh you know, start judging children for participating in it or, or, or anything like that. I think that ultimately it's funny. The average child out there enjoys uh, dressing up like the Lone Ranger or a ninja or something, and then they like getting the M&Ms, yeah. and that's about uh, the summation of the whole experience for them. Yeah. So, it, you know, to me it's one of those meat sacrifice to idols things, and you have to – You know, some people have chosen to enjoy the meat, uh, put some ketchup on it, eat it and say, uh, boy, that was a good hamburger. And then other people have said, oh, my gosh, do you know where that hamburger came from? Uh, We need to really probe the depths of where that meat came from. And I can't believe you're eating it. Um, So I I hope that helps uh, some, Anne. Yes, it does. It helps me a great deal. And I'm going to wait when you all have your announcements to know where to go on the website to look up everything and to get more in tune with your um, teaching because it hel- it's helping me a lot. All right. Well, glad to hear that, Anne. Thanks for calling in, and you call again anytime. Thank you uh, so much. You have a blessed day, okay? You too. Okay. All right. Well, uh, you know, for Anne's sake and for everyone out there, I want to give you the website. It's, it's churchwithoutreligion.com. Again, that's churchwithoutreligion.com. Uh, you're listening to Andrew Farley. This is Andrew Farley Live. We take questions for one hour each Sunday afternoon on Sirius XM and also on WAVA. WAVA, of course, is on the East Coast and hits Virginia, Maryland, and uh, parts of uh, West Virginia as well. 
and uh, we're delighted to make them part of our radio team as well. So uh, we're taking your calls now live at 877-956-9566. Again, that's 877-956-9566. I want to uh, let our, our, our uh, audience know that if you would like to get more and you're interested in books, uh, there's several books that you can find. Uh, the books that I've written are called uh, The Naked Gospel and The Naked Gospel was the first book. The subtitle is The Truth You May Never Hear in Church. Uh, The second book is God Without Religion. Can it really be this simple? And then more recently I wrote a uh, devotional called Heaven is Now. Um, And the most recent book I wrote with Mercy Me, the band, the Christian band Mercy Me, and the lead singer Bart Millard, uh, he and I wrote a book called The Hurt and the Healer. So maybe you know some folks that are hurting and you'd like to reach them. Well, Check out that book, The Hurt and the Healer, on Amazon. Um, let's go ahead out to Chris in Fairfax, Virginia. Hi, Chris. You're on the air. Hi, Andrew. So I suspect that one of the biggest lies that the enemy can give us is, okay, we're mature now in Christ, and now God expects us to not sin. Like, as we get more mature, then God's expectations go up. I think that's a really big lie that the enemy can throw at us. Mm-hmm. to make us feel bad whenever we sin because, oh, surely we should know better. I mean, we're we're in Christ. We're mature. And there's a, a verse that I think that uh, the enemy can use to that effect, and it's Luke 12, 47 to 48. And I wanted to get your opinion on it. It says, That servant who knows his master's will and does not get ready or does not do what his master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. So it sounds at first, at first listen, it sounds like, okay, yeah, God does expect more of me, but I don't think that's true. I think you're going to give like a perfect explanation. So why don't you go ahead and do that? Well, that's a great uh, question, Chris. I really appreciate you bringing that up. You know, sometimes we read the words of Jesus and we just wonder uh, what in the world. I mean, you know, sometimes he's talking about uh, us chopping off body parts. Uh, You know, we would look like an amputation ward if we listen to some of the stuff he says. Uh, Your eye causes you to sin. Block it out. Your hand causes you to sin. Cut it off. And, um, you know, this seems to be one of those times where, um, uh, you know, you look back at Leviticus 5, and it sounds very similar under the law. If a person sins, this is Leviticus 5.17, if a person sins and does what is forbidden in any of the Lord's commands, even though he does not know about it, he is guilty and will be held responsible. Um, And that's Leviticus 5. And then you say, well, wait a minute, though, I, I don't live in Leviticus I'm a Christian, uh, and so, you know, I'm a New Testament Christian. Well, in Luke chapter 12, we've got this verse here where Jesus is talking about a master and a servant. And, um, you know, there's this fearful expectation that if you don't do your part, um, it says the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. Uh, so, you know, you look at this and you say, what in the world, Jesus, how does this fit with the fact that you took the beating? You're talking about the master beating the slave. Well, you took the beating. Uh, you took the punishment. You paid the price. Why is this servant paying the price? And, you know, to me, um, the only uh, logical explanation is you say, well, well, who is Jesus teaching right here? Who is his audience? Is it before the cross or after the cross? Well, it's before the cross, and his audience is is Jewish. They are listening to every word coming out of his mouth. And he's already told them to be perfect and sell everything and cut off body parts. And then he's saying, you know, if you don't do your part, then God's going to come down with the hammer. Uh, Well, this is not really for a new covenant saved person. It's not for a child of God, uh, because if it were, then you'd better live in constant fear that God is going to cut you to pieces. Uh, for your disobedience and that you might end up being assigned a place with the unbelievers. Um, So, you know, to me, there's, you know, uh, disciples are asking Jesus, how can we be first? Who's going to be first in heaven? Who's going to be last in heaven? And, uh, you know, I mean, Jesus is laying out everything like don't 
don't worry about your life, don't worry about anything, you have little faith, what's wrong with you, sell your possessions, that's in the same uh, chapter as this, Luke 12, uh, sell your possessions, give to the poor, uh, never never be scared of anything, you know, you, ha- you totally are faithless, what's wrong with you people, I mean, it's just condemnation, condemnation, and I think Jesus does it on purpose, just like he tells the rich man to sell everything. Uh, it brings desperation and it brings a need for grace. And um, so, you know, if people who read Luke 12 out of context, they're going to end up with a disfigured face on their heavenly father. Uh, there's no way that the gospel makes any sense if God's going to beat you up or cut you to pieces uh, for your lack of obedience as a Christian. The whole point is Jesus took the punishment, paid in full. It's finished. And that's what we have to believe and celebrate about the work of Christ. Yep. And so what it seems to me that what he's really saying is if you know the truth of the gospel, then he just expects you to respond to it. He expects you to swallow it. He expects you to receive it, to not take a little bit of it and throw out the rest. And, uh, like a popular interpretation of this passage is like, if God gives you some spiritual gifts, you better use them. Like if, if he gives you a gift of evangelism, uh oh, like you, you have to go on the train and do the, what was it, one minute and 27 minute gospel presentation in every car. Hmm. And you have to go up, like stand up in a restaurant and preach the gospel in public. Like there's that condemnation that he can throw at us. Like, uh, just if you, interpret this to to apply a spiritual gift like oh my goodness he gave me the spiritual gift i have to use it he expects so much of me but i i would also say that that also isn't the correct interpretation that really what he's just saying is uh if you hear the gospel just just respond to it just receive it do you agree with that yeah i do and and you know i mean sometimes we just try to read too much into these parables i mean yeah. who's to say you know the master of one servant is the same master of the other servant i mean you know, you could even read in that the, the master of the good servant is God and the master of the other servant is Satan. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, these parables, they're not always so easy. And what we try to do is we try to put ourselves in the parable. Yeah. We say, where am I? Where am I? Which one mm-hmm. am I? Am I the good servant or am I the bad servant? Oh, my gosh. What if I'm the bad servant? And so we try to place ourselves inside of every story. And sometimes it's really not about us. And, and context is everything. Yeah. Yes, okay, so th- thank you for that. I, I just want to give a, a note to your listeners, if I may, uh, because this teaching is great. I just want to tell everyone who's listening right now, like, what you're hearing, uh, it's it's good stuff. Like, uh, at first, I didn't really get it, but if you continue in it and you really take the time to, like, if it, once you give it the time to sink in, because let me be honest, it does take some time. You won't get it immediately. But this has, like, extreme implications. Like, it, it's not just being free from the law. It's actually letting Jesus live in you and through you. Mm-hmm. And to whatever extent you, you're relying on yourself or you're relying on the law for your righteousness or you think that you have to perform, then that's actually not trusting in Jesus to live through you. And there's this lie that we have that, okay, I trusted in Jesus for my salvation, but then I'm just going to go and live on my own strength. And I don't think that's what God wants us to do. His heart has always been uh, depending on Him ever since the Garden of Eden and yeah. the two trees, and one of one of the trees was the tree of life. And in order to eat from the tree of life, I mean, Adam and Eve wouldn't even have to; they wouldn't be able to know the difference between good and evil. They would have to d- rely on that, uh, rely on God directly for that. So, so there's a, this dependence on God that God wants us to have for everything, not just salvation. And yeah, so I, Chris, uh, Chris, I, I agree with you, and I really appreciate your words. I mean, Chris's big point here is, people, that if uh, if people are, you know, noticing the grace message, well, yeah, the grace of God is the message, but there is a Jesus who is beneath this grace message. Jesus is grace. Grace is a person. We are not talking about just living in freedom, freedom, freedom. We're talking about the environment of freedom actually inspires dependency on Jesus Christ. And so we discover a new way to live. We don't just try to live for God, but instead we live from God. 
and that's a very different attitude. So, uh, Chris, I appreciate your, your time, your thoughts, your call. It's a great call. And uh, let's go ahead out to William in Toledo, Ohio. Hi, William. How you doing? Good. How are you, yes. sir? Oh, pretty good. Yes, I have a question. Um, uh, you ever heard of an uh, uh, organization called Divine Medical Research? Metaphysical no. Research? No. Well, they believe that uh, that uh, we shouldn't use the name of Jesus. We should use the name of Yahweh. Mm-hmm. It just don't seem right to me. It just seems like the name of Jesus is the only name we use. Uh, I just don't get it. Well, you know, the idea that we have to go Jewish as we call uh, call upon the name of God, you know, I mean, really, we have to watch out for that, number one. Uh, 90% of Christians are Gentile Christians, and we don't even speak um, Hebrew. And so, you know, uh, the idea that we have to use a certain human language to call on the God of the universe is absurd. Uh, you know, I mean, Jesus, the name of Jesus is different in, in every language of the world. Um, right. in, in Spanish, it's Jesus. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you have to, uh, I think, wrap your mind around the simple fact that God loves humans God loves humans uh, who speak many different languages. And the reason that Yahweh, uh, that name has been picked up and held above the others is, quite frankly, because people are still confused about the role of Judaism. They're still confused about the idea of the role of the law. And uh, they're trying to, in many cases, mix law with grace, which uh, right. is what angered Paul so much. He said, you foolish Galatians, who's tricked you? And the Galatians were being duped, and, and I'm afraid he'd say, you foolish Americans, to us today. Right. Well, they also don't believe in the Trinity. That's another thing that got me. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't believe that. So I'm just, I'm just confused about it right now. Well, you know, what I would say to you, William, is, uh, first of all, you sound like a, an American person who speaks English, and God is ready and willing to relate to you. Um, in the language that you speak, and I wouldn't give it another thought uh, about this uh, idea that you have to speak Hebrew to God or any of that. Um, it's a total distraction. Um, right. you know, Paul went into Ephesus. Paul went into Galatia. Paul went into Philippi, and he spoke those uh, languages to those people and presented Jesus in a language they could understand. And uh, he certainly didn't bring in the Ten Commandments under his arms and say, guys, let's start here uh, with Leviticus and let's do all the teaching in Hebrew. Uh, None of that happened. It's absurd. And, uh, you know, folks who are in love uh, with, um, you know, a law mentality, those are the ones that are pushing this. And I just encourage you, you know, you're a Gentile. You were never invited to the law. Uh, You were invited to one covenant and one covenant only, and that's the new covenant. And so you get to just uh, celebrate your Gentileness and celebrate the fact that God saved you through Jesus. And uh, you you can call Jesus by any using any language uh, in the world if you'd like. That's right. All right, All right thank brother. you. You bet. Well, appreciate uh, that call. Now let's uh, give the number out so folks can be a part if they would like to be. It's 877-956-9566. Again, 877-956-9566. Let's go out to Enterprise Alabama and talk to Sam. Hi, Sam. Uh, Hey. Um, Yeah, there was a passage in Revelation, uh, chapter 22, verse 18 and 19. Uh, I don't have it in front of me. But it uh, it says something like you know if you add to it or take away from it, then your your part in the tree of life and all this is going to be taken away or the plagues are going to be added to you. Mm-hmm. And I've always thought that you know if you were saved, there was no way you could have it taken out. So I, I kind of always I wondered what that meant. Yes, yes. Well, you know I think Revelation twenty two is really the key word here is prophecy, and prophecy of course means a message from God. Um, and so you know, it says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book and then adds to them. Well, that would be like anyone saying, hey, I have a new revelation, a new prophecy that is equivalent to revelation. Um, I have a new word from the Lord that is equal with scripture. And therefore, I'm going to present this to you and tell you that it is from the God of the universe and that you might as well add it to your Bible. 
And people who do that are false prophets. Uh, they're certainly on an ego trip. They're playing the role of God. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's someone who's not in Christ. Uh, and so I hope, hope that helps, Sam. I mean, basically, it's not the idea that, hey, um, a Christian messed up a little bit. No, this is a false prophet who is actually elevating something they've done or they've said or they've written or they've supposedly received out in the desert. Uh, you know, it kind of reminds you of Mormonism in a sense. you got the Bible and then you've got the Book of Mormon. And, uh, of course, Joseph Smith says, hey, I've got these uh, tablets. And they say, where are the tablets? And he says, oh, I lost them. Uh, let me go get them. I'll be right back. And he goes and he brings the tablets. And... Uh, and, and you know, he's put it on par with Scripture, and he says, I've had a second revelation. And uh, so then Mormons to this day will say, oh, yeah, we love the Bible. The Bible's great. And then they say, but we've got this second revelation, the Book of Mormon. And so Revelation uh, chapter 22 would be speaking to someone like Joseph Smith, a false prophet, who is putting forth a second revelation uh, that is supposedly equal with the Bible and, of course, deceiving people. Okay. Uh, see, the thing, like, it always bothered me was, like, am I going to accidentally add to this or take away from it or something? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, again, I think, you know, if you start just uh, saying, well, this is not the Word of God, or I've got something better, or let's, you know, get rid of some of it and add something in the, of my own, <laughs> you know, uh, this is not like a... I mean, of course, Christians have a million opinions. You know that as well as I do. We might have an opinion about when Jesus is coming back, or we might have an opinion about this verse or that verse. And and the Bible talks about interpreting, you know, studying and interpreting the scriptures and being a Berean and sort of debating over these things. And all that is healthy. But, you know, Revelation 22 is not talking about a debate about one verse or an opinion about some doctrine. No, no, this is like big picture stuff where you've got a new document or some new revelation that you're saying is just as good as the book of Revelation. That's some dangerous beliefs right there. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, brother. Thanks for your call. And, uh, you know, if you want to be a part of this broadcast, I want to invite you to go ahead and do that, 877-956-9566, 9566 Let's go out to... Maryland, Greenville, Maryland, and talk to Solomon. Hi, Solomon. Hey, how are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm blessed, blessed, blessed. Good. Go ahead. Now, the uh, the situation about Halloween mm -hmm. give me uh, give me some concern. Mm -hmm. uh, from the, my funny way of talking, you will know that I'm an African. Mm-hmm. And uh, my, I've been in this country for 34 years. I'm a minister. Mm -hmm. I had a program about five years ago in Buffalo, New York. I invited mm -hmm. an, evangel an evangelist uh, who happened to be of Jewish uh, background. She told me a story that she, she came from Canada, that she, uh, she had an Avon uh, agent that, sell, that sold her agent, uh, uh, Avon. And for a month, she tried to get in touch with the lady. She wouldn't return her call. And finally, after Halloween, the lady called her back and said, well, I got your missed calls, but that's the time of our fasting, that uh, we usually fast one, one month before Halloween. And the lady was surprised. Said, oh, so you are a Christian? Said, no, I'm not a Christian. Then, mm -hmm. what are you that you are fasting? Who are you mm -hmm. fasting to? Said, I'm a witch. Well, let me ask you, Solomon. I, I hate to interrupt you, but I mean, did you have a question? Um, is there a question that you wanted to pose? Yes. The question is: Do you believe in witchcraft? Do you believe in witches? And do you believe that there is a way of communicating and corrupting spirits? Okay. Human spirits? Sure. Well, thanks for your call, Solomon. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll put you on hold and hopefully I can address it some. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, clearly in the Old Testament, um, you know, the magicians under, uh, you know, Pharaoh, uh, they were using some sort of witchcraft. And clearly uh, the King Saul... 
Uh, you know, there was an episode where a witch was involved there and they were summoning uh, something. And, you know, I mean, obviously, like, I don't think that uh, tribal religions and other religions of the world are just entirely uh, nuts. Uh, they are experiencing something spiritual. Um, and Ephesians talks about dark forces uh, and that our enemy is not flesh and blood uh, and that the armor of God is our protection. And so, yes, I believe that there is an enemy. Um, in fact, you know, one of my books, Operation Screwtape, is uh, really written about, you know, what would the enemy be up to? If the enemy were to draft a battle plan, what do you think his plan is? Uh, what's he up to in your life? Uh, what kind of deceptions have you bought into? Um, Revelation says the enemy accuses us day and night. Uh, people claim to speak with the dead. Uh, and really, you know, I think they're, they're uh, you know, being played with. Uh, and the enemy is playing with them, toying with them. And so... You know, the enemy's goal is to keep us distracted. The enemy's goal is to keep us entertained with something. And so, you know, Mormons talk about a warm tingling in their stomach. <laughs> and then other, you know, I mean, other people talk about feelings that overcome them as they reach nirvana or get clear or uh, you name it. There's different experiences, right, with all these world religions. And so I don't think that they're just make-believe. They're not nuts. Uh, they're experiencing something, and the enemy is happy to give them a counterfeit. Um, so, yes, there's an enemy, and yes, there's people that try to relate to the enemy in some way. Uh, you know, the Bible talks about casting out of demons. So there have been people throughout history who've had a relationship of some kind with demons. But, you know, after you're done talking about the intricacies of all that you just sort of say okay now what and the point is uh let's set our minds on jesus let's fix our eyes on jesus christ it doesn't matter if there's one enemy or three enemies or a thousand enemies if there's one enemy idea or a thousand enemy ideas they're all just distractions so let's fix our eyes on jesus and say what did jesus christ do for me what did Jesus Christ do to me in making me a new creation? What does Jesus Christ want to do through me? And so as we uh, just decide to turn off the channel, switch the channel over and fix our eyes on Jesus, well, that changes everything. I want to invite your calls now, 877-956-9566. Again, that's 877-956-9566. We got another question while we wait here, um, and uh, we've got this question going on uh, from email, and we'll put it on now. It says that uh, we've been crucified, our old nature cut off. So how do we explain sin still living in us? It is not us anymore, but it still seems to be there. That seems contradictory. Can you explain? Well, that's a great question, and we'll take it in just a second here. Again, I want to toss out that number to you if you have a question much like this one or something different. The number is 877-956-9566. Well, um, yeah, our old self is definitely dead, Romans 6 says. Our old self is dead, buried, and gone. That's Romans 6.6. 6. Well, Galatians 2.20 also says, We've been crucified with Christ. Ephesians 2 also says that we've died and been raised up and seated with Christ. So there's no question that there's been a spiritual surgery. But, uh, you know, we're still getting the thoughts. Are you, are you getting the thoughts? Yeah, I'm getting the thoughts too. You know, those thoughts that tempt us. The accusatory thoughts. The temptation thoughts. The thoughts that we're embarrassed of, we say, gosh, I'm an eager, sincere child of God. Why am I still getting these thoughts? I thought I was a new creation. And then, of course, the enemy gets a foothold there. Oh, maybe I'm not saved. Maybe I'm not a real Christian. Real Christians never struggle. And we buy into these lies. Well, the reality is, is yes, our old self died. And the thoughts that we're getting are not from our old self. The thoughts that we're getting are from the flesh. Now, the flesh is not the old self. Let me explain. Uh, you go to Best Buy. Let's say you went to Best Buy tonight. You buy a computer. You unpack it. 
man, it's gorgeous. It's made of that silvery aluminum look, and you just set it up, plug it in, and you're loving it. You're on there about six minutes observing the beautiful, shiny new hardware, and you are just infatuated. And then, well, uh, you know, six, seven minutes into it, you get a warning. Software update needed. (laughs) I thought I just bought this thing. Software update Well, that's exactly like the flesh. You know, we need a renewing of the mind. We've got a new spirit. We've got a new heart. We've got Christ living in us. But we need a software update sometimes, don't we? we got that stinking thinking going on. So that's why we struggle. That's why we're still growing. And yet we are new at the core. Hope that helps. Let's go out to Lucy in Alexandria, Virginia. Hi, Lucy. Hi. Hey there, can um, you turn down your radio for us? I'm hearing myself there. I'm just moving away from there completely. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask, I wanted to ask about the Halloween celebration. Mm-hmm. I'm a Christian, and I won't let my kids go out for trick-or-treating and all of that. And I'm made to feel really bad by people who say, oh, it's just, um, a celebration, just where they get candy and all of that. And I'm thinking, if I do that, I'm compromising on my faith because I know what the basis of Halloween is. I know it's a celebration of witchcraft and all of that, the dead. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I just get torn. So it's hard for me to... What is the, What should be the stance of a Christian in terms of the Halloween celebration? Yeah, I would say, number one, what if there's no stance? Uh, What if there's not one right stance? In other words, would it be okay with you if this was just an individual choice, a matter of conscience? What if there's not one right thing or what one wrong thing to do? For example, let's say Christian A decides, well, you know, my kids, what they're excited about is dressing up uh, as a as a ninja or as the Lone Ranger or as a pumpkin or dressing up as Batman and going out and uh, getting some M&Ms and some Twizzlers and some candy, Starburst, and coming home. And, yay, we had a good time. We got to dress up and we got some candy. Um, you know, and Christian A decides, well, that's harmless, you know. Uh, It's not uh, worshiping the enemy or anything like that. These kids just like sweets and they like to dress up in fun costumes. Then the other person says, well, uh, you know, this really bothers me. I mean, I don't want my kids out there. I know the roots of this holiday and it really bothers me. And so I'm going to choose to keep my kids away from it and uh, do something else fun that night to occupy their minds and get their minds off of uh, that they're not participating with their friends and so all I'm saying is what if there's not one right answer Uh, what if uh, what if you can actually give thanks in all things what if a kid could trick-or-treat and then bring that starburst home and give thanks in his heart to God as he opens the wrapper and eats it is that possible well Paul says it's possible that we can actually eat meat that is sacrificed to idols and still give thanks in our hearts Uh, so, you know, there are no other gods. God's not threatened by Halloween. Uh, your, your righteousness is not dependent on whether you celebrate Halloween or not. Either way, you're right with God because Jesus died. Uh, and so what I would say is this is a matter of conscience and you really are free to decide. So I would say each man and woman needs to be convinced in their own mind of what they believe is the best for their children. Okay, um, thank you so much. I wanted to just say that I know that Christianity is about making choices. And if Christianity was left to the um, human beings interpreting whatever they thought, because I know that we're faced with different types of items these days compared mm-hmm. with what they had back then, like how they had to deal with molten images and calves and all of that stuff. I know that we have different idols. And I'm thinking, um, shouldn't we as Christians take a stand Mm -hmm. against what we know as an ungodly um, celebration? We can wear um, wear costumes and all of that stuff on separate things. But when when they go out to celebrate this, whatever they're doing, they're celebrating Mm -hmm. Halloween. 
Well, you know, you do, you know, you could you could take this and run with this, Lucy. You do that, and then you got another matter of conscience. You know, Christmas being December twenty fifth. Well, that's pagan. And then television. You know, look at all the junk on television. I think you ought to. You know, somebody could say, I think you ought to throw your television in the garbage. No TV, no Christmas, no Halloween. Even though it's Jesus' birthday, you might be celebrating in your heart. Well, December twenty fifth has pagan roots to it. Uh, Jesus wasn't okay. born. Jesus, yeah, Jesus wasn't born in the in the winter in December. Uh, there's no reason to believe that. And there's, you know, I mean, you could go on and on and on with this thing. And quite frankly, I think it's a rabbit trail. I think that we need to worship Jesus Christ and uh, choose regarding matters of conscience. And when you hit heaven, nobody's going to ask you, did you celebrate Halloween? They're going to say, did you depend on Jesus and love people? And all that matters, the only thing that's going to stand the test of time is dependency on Christ and loving people, not whether you celebrated a Sabbath or a Halloween or any of the celebrations of days. Uh, All of that is just a beautiful, glorious distraction. And the reality is let's let's depend on Jesus, choose from the for for our own matters. I'm sorry. To serve him and him alone. Yeah, no and God. so to, to to God, you know, each man stands or falls in God's own eyes. God's own eyes, and it's not really our call to judge other Christians about a holiday or a or a Sabbath day. You know, some people say all days are the Lord's, and some people like to say Sunday is special, and other people like to say Saturday is special. And I mean, you could just judge, judge, judge on all that stuff, and then, oh my gosh, they've got a TV, and they go to movies, and I mean, you could spend your life sort of trying to figure out, oh, what is the exact right thing to do in every case? Or you could depend on Jesus and love people. And um, all I'm saying is, there's a lot of matters of conscience out there, and uh, sometimes we just got to make up our own minds and not worry about what other people think. Thanks for your call, Lucy. I really appreciate you, and uh, uh, if you call back uh, again soon, thanks for your call. Now, Jenna is waiting impatiently. Thank you, Jenna, out in Warden, Virginia. Hi, Jenna. Go ahead. Hi. I think you may have already answered my question in in a way, because my question is very similar as to people judging their level of sanctification or righteousness, as well as the people around them, just basing their, let's say, worldview on Old Testament standards. And how does that fit into uh, trying to live in the new person, in the New mm-hmm. Testament way, in the and, and the new Jesus within, while there still is the flesh, as you talked about, and what is the basic standard um, to mm-hmm. live by, you know? And I think yeah. you answered that. It's just dependence on Jesus. So then that leads to another question. How do you do that as best as you can to ensure that you're walking in that mode? Yeah, that's a great question, and, I, and you know, I've never answered it in this way, but I'm going to try to express it based on some of my recent um, thoughts about this. Um, basically, we are hardwired uh, to depend on Jesus. Now that we are a new creation, um, it is really our default setting. In other words, we are in the Spirit And so, therefore, the most normal and natural thing for a person who is in the Spirit is to depend on the Spirit. And everything else is weird and doesn't fit and doesn't fulfill. And so, basically, I wake up and sometimes I try other strategies and other ways to get my needs met. And all I do over time is get burned by that. I mean, it disappoints, it frustrates, it exhausts me. And so, you know, as I let go of these things, Christian growth is almost like letting go of of these strongholds and footholds and and, and false strategies. We, We wake up and we let go of these false strategies. And then, you know, really the reality is Christ is in us. So he's all that's left. When you're done letting go of every other method, all you have left is Jesus and so we learn that over and over and over in different areas of our lives. Um, so, you know, it's a facade that Christians are getting stronger. We are actually getting weaker. Uh, we're coming into a new acquaintance with our weakness. 
And when we realize that, when we're acquainted with our weakness, then we see on a deeper level our need for Jesus. And he's all that we have left because he's in us and no one else is left standing. They have nothing to offer us. Uh, So, you know, I think that basically the word let sums it up. You know, let Christ dwell in your hearts by faith. Let your speech be seasoned with grace. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let, let, let. But, uh, you know, sometimes we have to go through a whole lot of other strategies before we're willing to give up and just let Christ do it. Does that help? That helps a lot. Good. Well, Jenna, thank you for calling. And um, you call again any time. I appreciate you. Let's uh, finish out the hour together with uh, Rochelle in uh, D.C., Washington, D.C. Hi, Rochelle. Hi. Go ahead. Yeah, I want to know is, okay, Jesus. Are they the same person? So Jesus was never a man. He didn't come down here as a man. He just, he was the son of God. So are they the same or are they two different people? Yeah, uh, Rochelle, your question is a great one. Is Jesus God or is Jesus only the son of God? And the answer is yes, he's both. And so that's why it's such a mystery. Um, Jesus is the son of God. He was born of Mary, and he lived 33 years on this planet, but uh, the Bible says in Colossians that Jesus was uh, at the creation of the world. And so, um, you know, all things were created by him, it says. And so Jesus has always lived. He is eternal. Uh, He has no beginning and no end, but he chose to spend 33 years with us in human form, And um, he was fully human and fully God. Uh, So what I love about that, Rochelle, is that it basically shows me that God was willing to become human and God is compatible with my humanity. So uh, Christ lives in me. And, you know, if you've received Christ, then Christ lives in your heart and he is totally compatible with you being human. Uh, and he demonstrated that already uh, through Jesus. So, so he, he was God. He was God. He is God. Uh, and he uh, lived here for 33 years and died and resurrected. Um, and he did that as a sacrifice for our sins. But he was and is God. Okay, that's what I needed to know. Thank you. So, but he never was a man. He never. He never was a man. He was the son of man. Uh, he was fully human and fully God at the same time uh, for 33 years. And see, that's why it's such a mystery. Um, and it's important to see both sides of Jesus' identity, fully God and fully man. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. so now I got it. Okay. Yeah. Because when he went to the cross, he, mm-hmm. but he talked to God As the in the Father. spirit. On the cross, mm-hmm. but that was God. Yes. Well, uh, you know, we're running out of time here, but I, I want to address that last question you had as we close out. Uh, absolutely. I mean, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he became sin in that moment. Isn't that beautiful? Have you thought about G- Jesus becoming sin? You know why Jesus became sin for that moment? He became sin so that you might become righteousness. He had never sinned, and yet he became sin. You have never done anything righteous, and yet you became God's righteousness as a gift. And that's the gospel, that Jesus Christ would come down and live as one of us, fully God and fully man. For more information on Andrew's books, please visit andrewfarley.org. That's andrewfarley.org. Join us every week at this time as we invite you to celebrate the freedom of God's grace. Goodbye, everybody.